as far as the trumpets go, we've got some hanging on the wall and some on the table uh, due to limited space. Um, but the ones that I set out on the table are the ones that I'm most interested in hearing you guys play today. Of course, we'll, we'll have you try anything that you're interested in. But um, the uh, my four valve trumpet aside, which is just there because I just didn't want to put it on the wall. Um, these these new horns represent two new two new models that we've got that are um, new mandrels. It's it's new new ground that we're covering, and uh, and so far they've been both the. the have been the bells of the ball at ITG for, for people who have been playtesting our stuff. And um, historically speaking, we've had two bell sizes, small and large. And, uh, and the small, was that's that includes our universal model, for those of you who have been looking online at, at the website at all, uh, which is a, a great horn and excellent for commercial work, and, and you can absolutely take it into any any trumpet section and it'll blend in perfectly well. And it's got, it's got enough character that it can be a nice horn for, uh, have have an interesting tone for soloists and, and all that, but but at the same time, you know, it, was, it simply wasn't a big enough bell for a lot of people, even people who are not playing on big bells, but rather say playing on a 37. So um, one of our new models, the classic model, is essentially that, an optimized 37 kind of vibe. So for the, for the Bach crowd and beyond those who are just playing 37s, they've really been enjoying the classic model. Uh, we've got it here on the table in one piece yellow brass and then two piece with a phosphor bronze flare, which is kind of customary for normally every every bell that we've ever worked with. We've had one of those uh, because it's just such a nice combination. The yellow brass does what you'd expect it to do. Um, you know, it gets a lot brighter as you step on the gas and warmer uh, until then. And then the phosphor bronze flare just kind of sprinkles some fairy dust into you know adds a, a bit more saturation. You know, it's like putting a photo filter on your on your tone and getting it to be a little bit richer, perhaps warmer sounding. Um, and then, then you know, one piece yellow brass does also what you'd expect it to do. And um, and we have really bummed. <laughs> it's been kind of a bummer. We were hoping that we'd be able to see which one is the winner, and that there'd be a clear winner, like this is going to be the classic model and this one's going to be the option, but they're still neck and neck. So, you know, every city we come to, we're thinking, maybe this city will, will be the tiebreaker, and, you know, there'll be a clear front runner. but uh, we'll just have to have you try them both and let us know what you think. Um, the other horn, so our, our, as far as our big bell goes, we've got these three horns are, the geometry is exactly the same. This final diameter is a little bit bigger on, on Big Bertha here, but, but otherwise the, all the, the internal geometry is exactly the same with these three horns. The only difference is the materials that we've chosen to put where. So this one has a yellow brass stem and a very pure silver flare. Um, and that's balanced out with a with a nickel silver lead pipe that kind of is a bit more rigid to drive, which helps offset the the, the loosey goosey quality of playing on a, of having a, a, a bell flare like that. So um, so these pair very well with each other. And there's a phosphor bronze slide. There's a phosphor bronze slide on all of these horns right now. Um, this horn differs only in the material difference in the flare, and the uh, and and this has a brass lead pipe instead of nickel silver. This also has a brass lead pipe, and the only difference is a copper stem. And they are they are drastically different <coughs> instruments. They're different beasts altogether. So geometry only kind of gets you so far, and then uh, choices in terms of you know what is what's the weight of the material and what is the material, uh, and that placement is something that we've done a tremendous amount of due diligence on and. Uh, and the result is you can take one bell and turn it into three horns, you know. And um, so, so there's that's a, that's been our big bell, and that's really popular among our. We've sold more big bell horns than than smaller bell horns historically speaking, but um, but there's still there was a need for jazz soloists to have a horn that blew a little bit more efficiently, that w that didn't start uh, as open in the bell and didn't have such a fast taper. Um, something that was just you know a, a little bit. Not a tight blow, but something that was, you know, really idiot-proof, you know, so you feel really empowered at the end of a of a five-hour playing day, you know, that kind of that kind of a horn, at the end of the night. And um, so what we did is, with this solo model, this is the first of its kind, and we're still going to go through and, and do more experimenting. We, we've got to go go through and, and do the, the, the uh, we are men of science kind of approach and make this bell in every single metal material and combination of materials until we we find um, what's what that's uh, basically you know new new material a uh, new new bell shape requires a, a complete you know back to the drawing board in terms of finding 
which materials are going to work best with that, you know, to unlock the, the qualities of that bell. So this solo model is really interesting in that it starts narrow with a nice slow taper like our small bell horns, uh, but then it, it, it flares open at the end. So you end up having a horn that blows, you know, it's like drives like a two-seater, but actually on the outside it kind of has the appearance of a, oh say, Hummer limousine, you know. So, um, so we've got this basically, this bell gives you a really effortless blow while still maintaining a sound that's in a higher weight class than a smaller horn. So, so this one, this is my new favorite. You know, as soon as possible. You know, whatever. One of the horns that uh, that will be part of that shootout that we'll make with the with all the different bell materials. One of those is going to be mine for sure. And we've got a lot of other people in line, including some some, some pretty famous trumpet players waiting to get their hands on one of these. Um, so this this one is super cool. The, um, the the our first shot was was already you know first kill with this one. We've got a bronze lead pipe. We just wanted to make it as beefy of a sound as we could, knowing that we'd be sacrificing a little bit of the size of the sound by having a slightly slower taper at the beginning of the bell. So um, so we went straight to bronze here, and um, strangely that kind of made it n <laughs> impossible to use a bronze tuning slide, which is normally my favorite, but there is definitely such thing as too much bronze. And bronze receiver, lead pipe, and tuning slide bow is categorically too much bronze. So um, this horn only works, this particular horn only works with, uh, with brass and nickel slides. Um, the same description that I gave you for what mouthpieces do when you make them out of nickel or bronze, the same exact holds true on, on the horns. Um, and the most influential place on the, on a horn that where you can you know help determine what its qualities are going to be both playing f play feel wise and tone quality wise it's the, the tuning slide the material of the tuning slide bow is 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 the second most important place on the horn after the bell in determining what you're listening to and um, and so nickel really does weaponize that sound this this is a very very exciting horn with a nickel slide in it with brass it's you know much more mellow and chill at, at, at softer dynamic levels and and it gets not quite as angry when you step on the gas but angry enough for for many people so um, so this is this is kind of a, a unique thing a unique blow uh, and it gets for me even more um, fun to play with with heavy caps on the top to just add even more stability in the upper register. I, I had um, the opportunity to just play one tune live with a band while we were passing through in Vegas, and, uh, and I had the heavy caps on it. And what I played, you know, listening back to the video, it's like, yeah, okay, that wasn't I wasn't you know focused on musicality so much in this moment. I you know didn't know what the form was going to be, being a bit reactionary. But I loved going back and listening and just saying, man, clearly I felt very comfortable. You know, I was just like. You know, just... <laughs> You know, it was the kind of the feeling. It's like I can do anything, and I was, you know, articulating stuff. I was attempting things that I normally wouldn't, even you know, given the stability of of our other horns. Um, so it was, it was definitely, it was, it's kind of like it was daring me to to try things, other new things. So I would definitely encourage any of you who play solos to uh, to try out this horn, or those of you who have uh, a section work the majority of the time, but in a section where politics doesn't determine that you must play X, Y, or Z horn, where it's a little bit more, you know, choose your own adventure. This horn has the ability to still blend in with a section very well, especially depending on how we, you know, what direction we tip it in with material of mouthpiece and what slide you're using. Um, this one will still fit into a section, even playing lead, but, but certainly any of the lower parts. Uh, so this is kind of the last stop along the way to be having a horn that, that really does fit appropriately into a section. Whereas, of course, you can you can take a bigger horn into maybe some big bands, they don't really care. It's, you know, anything goes. But, um, but you know, in an orchestral section, you get some weird looks having having twice the amount of sound as, as you know, as your colleagues. But with this one, there's there's something about it that just makes it, you know, you will have the biggest section sound, sound in section, but at the same time, it'll still work. So so really, even if you're exclusively playing classical music and you're, you're doing exclusively section work, check this out too. 
Um, and for commercial stuff, this is, I think, for sure the best horn in the in the room, just because you can um, you get that extra breadth, that extra width of sound that a, that a soloist will want on gigs. And also, when you get into a, a three-man horn section, say with a trombone and a sax, the bigger bell, the bigger you know, the fatter, richer tone will also blend better with those folks. So it's um, it's really really great for all that stuff. So. So basically, that's that's what we're looking at. We got our Silver Flare, our um, our Universal Max, and our Solo Max, and we got the Solo model. Two options for the Classic model. Um, this is the Universal, so that's the smallest, you know, kind of most narrow. And um, this is the two-seater sports car, <laughs> you know, a, a, among the group. And uh, and then here I've got my um, my horn, my personal horn, which is a, a Solo Max at the moment, and uh, and I've got the fourth valve. Or the F attachment here, which is um, interesting. If any of you guys really like playing pedals, you say you've got the stamp routine or something like that that you're just dedicated to, and and you you love going in the pedal register, then uh, then by all means check this out because as far as I'm concerned, this is this is the way to make a four valve horn. Otherwise, you got an extra piston here and all this metal down here, and it's a very top head front heavy experience. And I can palm a basketball, and I still don't like holding a four valve a four piston block. You know, it's just not it's not fun. Um, um, but here, you know, children can learn how to play four valve instruments, and and uh, and it really opens up the musical possibilities yeah. when you play that. You know, when you can even just adding an E, you know, just two more half steps. That's everything ever written for clarinet. If you can add, you know, an E flat, that's everything ever played by an alto sax. You know, like burning through the Omni book or something like that. Super fun to do when you don't have to make adjustments for octaves and stuff. So. So, um, you know, just a, a quick um, encouragement to not shy away from the, the, the idea of expanding your range down significantly. Cool. Yeah. Can and you go back to the comment you made about, you are talking about construction of other horns, you know, yeah. causing problems in middle, low, middle, and high. Yeah. And the, the, the mouthpieces address a lot of that. Yeah, the mouthpiece is to blame for all of that. It's hard okay. to blame the horn. I mean, Explain some horn, a little more about this. Some horns will have uh, pitch problems inherent to their geometry. You know, like uh, a lot of, a lot of horns, <laughs> without naming names, a lot of horns will have like a, a, the middle E partial, which includes D, will be pretty flat, like yeah. noticeably flat. Yeah. And then a lot of horns will have the G partial, the high G partial, be pretty darn sharp. Mm -hmm. And um, you've really got to pull stuff down, which is so bizarre because with the horn making that high G partial sharp, but then the high C, because of almost every mouthpiece out there being flat, you know, you start dealing with these really shitty intervals that really throw a monkey wrench into a lot of, uh, you know, into the ability to just play evenly and play in tune. You've always got to lift your D, but you're, you're you know, playing D, G, you know, you got to lift the D and bring down the G, and then if, if, God forbid, the next note you have to play is a C, where you have to do heavy lifting again, it's just... It's it's sabotage, you know. That's that's the thing, you know. And and uh, how do the mouthpieces address that? The, so mouthpieces determine, aside from those kind of wonky things that are that are that, well, that, that in the, in this case the, the 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 E partial and the G partial, those are the things you can blame on the horn. And for for the majority of trumpets, those are the only kind of wonky notes. Sometimes horns will have a low A flat that's really low, or some some weird bear like that. But but otherwise, the intonation that you experience when you're playing the instrument really comes down. Down to the mouthpiece, and um, you know, I mean, you can you can do the historical digging. Uh, Bach was, you know, he had uh, yeah, thousands of blanks that he was working with and, and and drilling out to become this mouthpiece or that. But this was at a time when when trumpets in A were still a thing, and so the blanks were appropriately, you know, the the if you pull out the tune, it, you know, and, and this is this, this is just re repeating history. You can look all this stuff and it's, it's, look this stuff up and go down the rabbit hole at your leisure. But but um, you know, the cases been made that if you pull your slide out almost all the way and your trumpet is essentially in the key of A, that your that your Bach mouthpiece plays perfectly in tune, top to bottom. Um, but at some point along the way, wires got crossed and mouthpieces stayed in the key of A, um, which make which is the reason why they suck even worse on C trumpets because they're even further away from what would be optimized for the intonation on the C. Um, and now we're talking alternate fingerings in the middle register. I mean, it's yeah. just come on. So. Uh, so the, the intonation of the mouthpiece is, is the problem. Is, it's, it's the reason for having to do heavy lifting in the upper register and push smearing down low notes. And then, you know, there, over the course of history, people have, have had different approaches to dealing with that. Conrad Gazzo, for instance, one of the greatest lead players America has ever seen, would, you know, play with his tuning slide all the way in 
where the upper register was in tune, and then anytime anything went down below middle, like essentially middle C was his low C, so he was just <laughs> pretending he's playing a piccolo or something, you know? And then anything, any unison line below that, he'd just lay out, you know, because he, he, just, he knew well enough to set the intonation for, for, his, for the system to work in the money zone, you know, where he, and, um, and that. So, so really the, the, the problem is, is, is faulty geometry, and it usually has to do with things being too long. Uh, so, you know, you've even got companies, it's hard to have this conversation without naming names, but I, all I can do is pull out cases in point. You know, you got guys like, uh, like GR, for instance, Gary Radke does, does a very thorough job of considering every single little, you know, detail about his mouthpieces, except for the length, that's standardized, and he didn't write anything in, in that entire freaking webpage. There's nothing about why they are the length that they are, and, you know, this is what I've chosen, and this is why says nothing about that. So, you know, still there, there are major blind spots for, you know, for, for lots of mouthpiece makers. So the, um, the thing is you just have to, you have to acknowledge that, that a different depth of cup is going to require to start, you know, right off the bat is going to require a different length of mouthpiece. And then the devil's in the details from there, going in and, and uh, how, far you, how far you tool in, how you machine in, and, and how, how long that throat is, and, and what's going on. So, so I've, um, I've experimented with a lot of different ways of getting two equal tempered octaves. And, and obviously I was coming from playing on Monet mouthpieces from 2002 to... Um, I got my first horn in 2007. I think I was finally off of everything, became a m recovering Monet addict, but, uh, about you know after about ten years of playing on those mouthpieces, so so I became very accustomed to equal tempered octaves. Um, but that and that is, he found a really elegant solution for how to how to make that happen. That's um, you know for most most mouthpieces, not all of the mouthpieces in his line actually do have perfect intonation, and it's because. You know, you can never you can never get away with setting constants in a in a in, a, uh, <clears throat> in an equation as complicated as a mouthpiece and its intonation. You really can't can't set any constants. Everything's going to have to be a variable, depending on on the cup. And uh, and so, in in the case of Monet mouthpieces, right? They got you know the cup and then a determined length of the mouthpiece, and then he's got you know a few tools that go in and drill out a backbore that is an exact straight taper from you know from the end of the throat to the end of the paper thin backbore and that's that um, and that's that's a very elegant solution for just knowing without having to do much experimentation that the that this intonation is going to is going to line up um, but it leaves a lot to be desired in terms of nuance you know it's kind of a, a a reason why a lot of classical players don't go for those mouthpieces, aside from the politics and whatever, which I cer certainly won't get into. There's also the fact that, you know, there, when you have a straight taper like that, you're sort of inviting a more monochromatic tone quality. You know, there's, the, you know, not necessarily finding that, that classical pop of, of your articulation or being able to, to change the tone so drastically or whatever. So, so when you're making backboards for a mouthpiece, there's always, you know, there are multiple plates spinning at the same time. There's intonation, uh, and then there's also just playing qualities. So when, when we've really gone down the rabbit hole with these mouthpieces, um, which wasn't even my first rodeo, the, um, the things to watch out for, you know, we basically divide the backbore into like thirds or quarters and dealing with each individual piece of the backbore, dealing with different tapers and, and the lengths of those tapers. And it, I mean, it's, it's a never-ending rabbit hole, so um, it's uh, it helps to, to work with you know with people who have been doing custom mouthpiece design for a really long time, tweaking things out as we did in Switzerland, um, and then from there it's been okay. So now we've got a pretty good 2L. Now let's make 10 other variations on that theme of the backboard, tiny adjustments of a millimeter or so, you know, in the in the length of, of each of those quadrants, you know, and and, the, and slight changes to the taper. We, we do massive shootouts like that and say, okay, cool. Among these 10, I really like the articulation of this one and I really like the tone quality of this one. What, what happens when you step on the gas? So, okay, what are we looking at here? Okay, now we're going to need to make an 11th one, which is a hybrid of these two. So it's, it's, you wouldn't even believe how deep we've gone down the rabbit hole with, with this stuff. And, uh, 
And basically, I've, I, I submit myself as the crash test dummy for, for all this stuff, which has not been the easiest role to, um, to maintain, but, but, um, but it's cool because uh, I'm still, still standing. And the result is that I've been able to, to eliminate 95% of, of all the, the question marks. And then we, you know, we get to we've now we've got years of play testers under our belts, you know, that that make up for for the last five percent. And now we know what works for, what works for most people. And and that's why we've come to we've got high compression versions and normal versions that have the same intonation uh, settings. Normally, if you if you <coughs> compress the throat a little bit, you're going to change the for sure. You're going to you'll end up having a <coughs> a longer throat as well, and it'll change the intonation properties. But all of the all the behind the scenes magic that we've got going on really maintains a very consistent configuration of intonation, and uh, and it's it's a little difficult to even describe what that is because it really is just such a balancing game. It's a very complex equation for every mouthpiece, and and uh, so once we get the qualities you know dialed in the way that we want them, and, uh, we want them, and it's like oh yeah, this mouthpiece is is clearly the right tool for 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 this job or that job. Then it's like, yeah, but okay, so the, the harmonic series is slightly compressed or, sl or, or actually we went a little too far and the high notes are a little too high and the low notes are a little too low. Um, and then, you know, just we'll deal with that on a geometric level to be able to, to adjust the spatial relationship between all the harmonics. So that's really, that's the name of the game. Uh, and it is not an easy game. And, and I think the reason why other mouthpiece makers simply don't do as good of a job of, of making the intonation perfect as we do, or as perfect as anything, you know, the mouthpiece is set perfectly, but anytime you're dealing with a length of tubing like this, it's not, a, it's not an equal, the harmonic series in nature is not an equal tempered thing. So there's always going to be <clears throat> some of that. So. I use the word perfect with a with a big bold asterisk, but but otherwise, um, you know, we we have perfected the intonation of the mouthpieces where other companies haven't. I think just because we're unwilling to quit, you know, like I, I'm it's <laughs> double edged sword, but I'm willing to push until people say enough, I'm broken, no more, um, and and not until we get there, <clears throat> you know, and even and even then, it's like okay, good, so we'll start again tomorrow, um, <clears throat> you know, until we obstinately find what we're looking for. Um, I think it's, it's really easy to just stop at 90% and say, oh, I mean, this, this is great. This, I mean, come on, come on. Um, but that sort of uh, mentality is, is, not, is not where we're coming from. So that's why we end up with, with perfect intonation instead of close to perfect intonation. A little bit of heavy lifting. Like, uh, for instance, I tried a mouthpiece recently that I actually really liked. I thought there's a lot, there's a lot of value here. That's the Tom Hooten Yamaha custom mouthpiece. It's a nice, I'll, I'll try, it's a hell of a lot better than a one and a quarter C, for sure. But the intonation is still a little compressed. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm being real obstinate and I get up to that high C, it's 15 to 20 cents flat, which is better than a lot of, you know, I, I'm actually playing a high B open with a lot of other mouthpieces. So it's close, but it's just a great case in point of like, oh man, guys, if you would just, if you had just gone a little bit, you know, or, um, you know, and, and, and there's also, it comes down to the play tester. You know, maybe that's exactly where Tom wanted those notes, because mm -hmm. that's where he's, or because it was easier than what he was playing on before. There was yeah. less compression than before. Yeah. But, you know, Tom it hasn't made a career out of play testing mouthpieces and making sure that he can identify <coughs> exactly where, you know, equal, uh, equal tempered octaves occur. So it's, it's, I just really think that it's, it's the uniqueness of, of our team. Uh, and, and my obsessive compulsive disorder that ends up getting us over the finish line um, beyond where, where others kind of just call it quits and say, ah, we'll just you know, give them a whole bunch of cups and backboards and let them figure it out. Feel free to buy 10 of them, you know? <laughs> um, so hopefully that answered your question thoroughly enough. Um, yeah, I guess there's enough players in this room. We should start hitting, hitting it, huh? Can we ask you yeah. to do a demo on each one of those? So that on the horns? Yes. Yeah, sure. So this is, uh, let's see, and I should have, um, of course, we, we ship our horns with two or three tuning slides. Uh, you guys don't have to worry about it. By the way, we're, we're filming everything. We're going to have it all online anyway. But um, Just for fun. We can, we can swap out tuning slides, and when you, when you talk to our sales guy, Charlie, um, you know, you get, he'll help you figure out which slides we should send in the first place, because change a tuning slide, change the horn. Um, and brass, bronze, and nickel is a very wide uh, amount of change too. So okay, so I've got the brass slide in, and I've got my essentially one and a half D in, and these are the first notes of the day. So you know, those of <laughs> you watching at home, you know, easy. And, um, and 
it's, it's a, a trumpet. You know what I mean? It's a very resonant trumpet that really holds the road when you when you step on the gas. And... and it's really super stable, and it doesn't take a lot of gas in order to get it to redline. Every horn has a built-in F, which is pretty appreciated. <laughs> Very, very zippy horn. Even without a lead piece in it, you know, a D cup is not a, it's not an aggressive mouthpiece. Um, so, you know, it's it's a it's a flamethrower when you want it to be. Otherwise. said that B cup that does not cut you off in the upper register um, that's it's just as easy to play you know a double G for sure it's just you're gonna get a very different tone quality like you just heard so so um, that's the universal piece and the right tone quality, you can still get as much soloistic character quality, you know, personality as you, you know, mm. that's pretty much on you. But then if you swap out the brass slide for bronze slide, that definitely thickens the sound up. So you got that um, on that side, but then classical would be like. You know, it's it does the job, absolutely, um, for sitting in a classical section. Um, especially if your section is a little bit on the brighter side. Um, otherwise, we'll, we'll get there right after this to, to the classic models, but. You know, it's it's really it's a beast. It's a hell of a sports car for doing commercial and lead stuff. Um, and it, you know, it's like it, instead of it never ever gets brittle. Even if you pop in, you know, a, here's a three small. So we're talking like a a three or even a five e. You know, not not a big cup. There's, there's never a moment when you're like, ooh, that's ugly. It's really exciting, but it never gets brittle. It never, you know, does that thing when, you know, it's like, okay, we've, we've crossed a line somewhere a while ago. Please point that in the other direction, sir. Um, it, it never hits that. And, and I think mostly that has to do with the bronze that's, that's on here. Um, the bronze tuning slide certainly helps. Um, but the, the bronze flare also just adds a beautification filter. I think when you when you're talking about really stepping on the gas. Uh, then we get to the classic models. Um, I'll start with the one piece yellow brass. This is um, Ryan Kaiser is playing one of these in Lincoln Center now, and uh, and pretty soon we'll have one in the Concert Cabal Orchestra, and, uh, and and shortly thereafter, with all the orders we've been getting, we're going to have some of these things everywhere. But um, it's the the goal here was we're gunning straight for Bach. You know, you can feel free to you know never play your Bach again after you've after you've tried this horn. It's kind of the 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 size and character of the sound that we're going for. So here's um on the two XL two. And that just lights up even easier for me than, than the universal. Like at an even softer dynamic level, the sound is everywhere. It's just a shiny thing. Super, super stable. That's, now we're talking mean classical, you know, that's, that's for, for all your symphonic needs, this will, this will definitely take care of it. And, um, and it does. 
Every note is just, it just feels like you're on track, like you're on rails, you know, and that's, that's a wonderful feeling. The, the, the reason why I describe this as an optimized Bach or 37 kind of vibe is, is because it, it has the same, if, with your eyes closed, it'll scratch the same itches, you know, for people who are expecting a particular range of tone quality and, and, and size and shape of sound, you'll still get that, but without any of the intonation problems and without, without it changing pitch depending on the volume you're playing at, which is a thing that not everybody's conscious because fish don't know that they're in water. They grew up in it. It's, you know, <laughs> nobody explained the concept to them. Um, and we grow up playing trumpets that go flat the louder you play and sharp the, higher you, the softer you play. This, our trumpets don't do that, and there are very few brands in the world that, that can say the same. So there's a, that, it's just, and Bach is not one of them, <laughs> nor is Yamaha. So um, that feeling of stability, that just that, that consistency, no matter what volume you're playing at or what range you're in, everything is always just going to be the same intonation, always. And it becomes a lot easier to access mastery when when you've got all those variables thrown away. You know, you just you don't have to worry about any of it. Every, every note lives in one spot and only one spot, uh, regardless of the context that you find yourself in, or, and regardless of the mouthpiece that you put in it, you know, ranging from extremely shallow to extremely deep. So um, that, that means that really, if you, if you sort of go in and, and look at the root programming in our brains of what we're, getting our bo what we're forcing our bodies to do in order to compensate for all the, all the, the, the freaky, weird stuff that the trumpets do uh, based on the volume you're playing at and the combinations of different mouthpieces. You just throw away all that code and all that stuff you get to delete. You end up with a much smaller manual of, hi, my name's Adam, and this is what I'm doing to play the trumpet. Um, and the, the simpler you can make that job, the more time you can spend being musical. You know, and, and just enjoying the, the social aspect and the musical aspect of the music instead of, you know, constantly uh, concerning yourself with, with the technique and, and, and stressing about taking a few days off, God forbid, you know, because once you do, you come back on the horn and, or you're all over the place. But that's not on you. That's, that's the horn's fault. You know, that's a, that has to do with, the, with the, the horn and the mouthpiece and the kind of environment that they, that they set you up with, you know, if, and either <laughs> conducive towards your success or not. Um, so, so this horn is, is really just kind of, it is the optimized experience of what people, most people are looking for when, they've, when they're playing on a Bach or Yamaha. It's, they, they're, they're fitting into a, a very traditional soundscape and, uh, and, and, and that, and they're just looking for easy. Well, here's easy. <laughs> here's easier. So I'm looking forward to hearing you play the, these. But um, quick little demo difference between the two classic models that have this one with the one-piece yellow brass and this one with uh, the Foster Bronze Flare. I'm really working on the vibrato so you can hear not just like one tone, but the sort of an oscillation of tones. You can hear on, on the brighter side of it and, and, and on the darker, the, the more contracted side. sound still in your head. So they're clearly cut from the same cloth, but there is there's a there's a difference in tone which I think you could probably appreciate more in a, in a bigger room, but um, it's six of one, half dozen of another. It's like some people like this color green the best, some people like that color green, you know, there. But it's, um, there are two different options to get you even closer to, to the, that optimal tone. And it's funny how, I mean, it's, maybe I'm jinxing this by saying it ahead of time, but almost every single time that somebody play, play tests these, they definitely have a preference, and they say that the other one is harder to blow. It's the same exact geometry. 
So there's some interesting psychosomatic relationship there between the sound that you're hearing and what you think you need to do with your body in order to get closer to that sound that you're searching for or whatever. So, so uh, keep that in mind that it's really, they are exactly the same horn. And uh, me being the princess and the pea, I can, I can vouch for that. They don't, they don't blow differently. Um, so, but they just, you know, they have, they have slightly different tones. Right, so that was the universal and the two options for the classic model. And those are not the same bell shape, but they're in the same kind of, we'll say, weight class. The final stop along that way is, uh, is the solo model, which starts with the same geometry at the early part of the bell. Let's start with the brass slide in. And, uh, and then we, uh, we graduate to something that's a bit more open. So... That's a different tone. I mean, if I just noodle around here for just a moment on, on even the darker of these two. That's a lot more sound, you know. But it doesn't blow any differently. That's kind of the thing, is that you just feel that same amount of healthy resistance and, and, uh, and it just feels quite supportive in your efforts. Then you put the, uh, put the nickel slide in here. <laughs> mm. So you get something that's both fat and rich, but also has this like, you know, has teeth in it. You know, like if I'm if I want to, you know, role play Roy Hargrove or something like, I would do it with this horn, right? Um, and that's just this is with an enormous. This is a one and a half B that I'm playing. Keep that in mind. You know, so if I switch to a medium cup, which is like the equivalent of a Bach D cup. It's a lot, it's a lot, and it's really, really deceptively easy to get all that tone. Um, so the, one of the things you'll want to watch out for when you're playing these horns is not overblowing them. You know, you're, you're accustomed to thinking that you got to push hard, you know, to, to, to a certain level in order to excite the, the, the horn and the mouthpiece, whatever, and, and also uh, just to, to arrive at a, at a type of resonance, a type of sound, but that's, that's really sort of bullying the horn into producing tone. These horns really do not require that. They're not high maintenance. You just, you know, get vibration going, you know, and, and they, they, as acoustical instruments that, that amplify sound, will do a very good job without your, you know, your overkill. So just explore that, for, <laughs> um, that concept while you're playtesting these things. Now, um, here's probably the next, the next size up, the, the, probably the next closest horn to that solo. Now we get into the full-on large size bells. And, uh, and this one has been, a, has been a top seller in years past, but at this point it's starting to get, starting to get uh, buried by, by the competition. Um, this is our Universal Max, which has, well, has a lot of quality, so I'm just, just play it. I mean, there's, it's undeniably more sound than, than the other, but it's not that far away. It, they're in the same weight class in general, um, but this one takes more air. Um, it's not sucking it out of you, but you know, there's, there, you, can, you can feel a difference in, in, uh, in resistance. The, all of our horns are built on 460 valve blocks, so it's not nothing is large bore per se, but this has the vibe of a large bore horn because of, because of the geometry in the bell. Um, and so for that reason, that can be, you know, that can kind of go over the line for some people and, and the, the, the degree to which resistance helps them, you know, they might not find enough here. Um, deeper cup. Um, so 
that's a that's a fun horn. It's a lot of horn, and it basically just sounds like a trumpet. You know, like a whole lot of trumpet. But then for our our two other big big horns with the same geometry, um, we get into more specialized tone qualities, like this. Uh, Britannia silver, purer than, st than sterling silver bell, which is a real pain in the ass to, to, to <laughs> combine with a yellow brass stem, by the way, but totally worth our efforts. Um, this is the one that Marcus Printup is using in Lincoln Center. And, um, it's very, very interesting tone quality here. When you play soft, it's extremely warm. There's a lot of deep ooh in the sound, 300 hertz, 800 hertz, like a lot of, a lot of cream. And then there's a lot of shine, especially when you step on the gas or you put in a you know, mouthpiece that wants to go there. Not as many mids. It's, it's, that's kind of the, the differentiating factor with this sound is that it's, it's kind of like how Bose likes to make their headphones, you know, lots of sugar and salt and, and not all that much in the middle. So you got this extra special kind of sound. I'll pop in the medium cup to show you a little bit more what I mean there. There's a lot of that stuff in the sound, and just, just you know, there's there's a lot of that wafting off the bell too. So it's a very very interesting soloistic sound for sure. And um, I've gotten to hear Lincoln Center a few times in big rooms in the Concert in in, uh, in, in in the Netherlands and and other you know obviously in, in Lincoln Center and Rose Hall and and some other places. And and it's wonderful to hear what kind of intimate connection you can still, you, you, you have to, to Marcus from the back of the hall. It's, you know, because there's the, the, the particular like resonance qualities of these horns, the way that they ring in your hand and everything, you, you've got this like whoop, 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 whoop kind of thing happening in the ears. And that whoop, whoop, whoop travels the entire space, you know, that wh whatever size space you're playing in. So that feeling that whoop, whoop, whoop in our ears from like the 45th row, kind of makes you feel like some, they're right there next to you whispering sweet nothings in your ear. It was really, really cool quality. And so, um, I, it was very interesting listen to, listening to Marcus from that far away for the first time, just going, wow, what a hell of a sound. There was only other one trumpet in that section that had that kind of presence of sound, but it was a very different tone quality that was, you know, comparatively definitely lacking in shine. And um, and so to hear some, another horn that was like, wow, same weight class, but a more a more full-bodied uh, you know, thing. It's all subjective, of course, but to my taste, and a lot of other people at Renia Hall that would turn around and look at me like, oh my god, you sound so good in your horn. <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of people I, I see, I tend to agree that it's just a, it's a massive sound that's, that's really quite interesting. Um, it's basically where the, where the silver flare is at. Um, and the, the same description holds true for the solo max, but just in a different direction. That was this. Thankfully, our tuning slides are made perfectly, so they are interchangeable. <laughs> like, really interchangeable. The horns aren't put together with jigs, but the tuning slides are, and then the horns are made to fit to you know standardized tuning slides, so it's not a problem to, to mix and match. Um, right, solo max. I think I'm just going to go straight to uh, to my my XL2 mouthpiece, the equivalent of a B cup, and I'll show you the softer side first. accessible there with, with that same kind of warmth and stability at, at, at pianissimo. You can really, really feel it hold the road. Um, and then... Yeah, 
I mean, that's again a one and a half B on a big horn, a big bell. You know, it's the the range of expression is is ridiculous on this horn, uh, and that has a lot to do, of course, the geometry being big. Um, the final diameter of the bell goes to five and three quarters. Um, it's not because the bell here opens up any differently than the others. It's just we just cut it off a little bit longer. And um, the stem being made in copper is kind of what gives it its unique quality because copper, the reason why it's such a commonly used material for, um, for say, bells of flugelhorns and stuff is, is because it's such a, a warm and creamy tone when you play soft. And, uh, and on a flugelhorn, you typically never go anywhere else, so copper is a you know, good way to go. Thing is that for trumpets, I find an entire copper bell to be to just not be enough. It's too soft of a material, I think, to, to include the flare in copper because it just it's not as good of an amplifier. And and when you step on the gas, especially, the, the what's what's getting projected has the potential to, to be a little bit brittle to my ears. So um, so even with a copper stem, we still finish it off with a phosphor bronze flare. And um, and that's a much more dense, rigid material. It's a real pain to work with, but it's it's totally worth it because that Adds a, a stability to the, in, you know, and a, and a consistency to the, to to your, your feeling of stability even at the at the loudest dynamic levels. It never breaks up. The sound never starts to, you know, to do what an all copper bell would do. So um, so again, in terms of the optimization of materials and their placement, uh, this is another really big victory, I think. So um, that was with a, a big mouthpiece. I'm just going to demonstrate really quickly one thing that I love about this horn. Here's our, we haven't, this is, these aren't for sale yet, but, um, and only a few people have them, but Chris Bodie is one of them who really loves his extra, extra large cup. Basically, you can take the family, you can take the kids swimming in this mouthpiece. Um, it's, it's a big one. Um, I mean, there's no brass left in that sound. It's just, it's just pure love. There's nothing else. Um, but the thing is that the intonation is still absolutely flawless. You can still step on the gas and it'll still get brassy. So this this cup is is awesome. I'm looking forward to being able to launch this and have some more folks play on it. But in the meantime, I just it, it's a it's a nice way to also show off the range of, of, of expressive capacity with this horn. It's all there, and it's in tune. You know, the reason why I can just you know hit that stuff and, and not strain while doing it is because the G it still lives exactly in the in the perch where it, where it should be, and it's not up here. It's just you know reach right forward and, and push the button. Uh, so and that that holds true to the even the deepest of our mouthpieces. You know, that's that is that is an accomplishment. Um, but this horn is is just really sweet for that. Even even if you're playing a lead mouthpiece, this is like a. Uh, maybe like a 5E. You know, th there's still like such a power, a size to that sound. I mean, it's shiny, it's exciting, it's got all the, you know, all the things you'd expect when you put pop in a lead mouthpiece. But you can also like, do in a commercial, I, I actually like doing commercial gigs <clears throat> with a lead mouthpiece on this horn because it blends so well with the tenor sax and the trombone if you're doing a, a, a pop horn section, you know? It's just, it's a very strange, I guess it may be coming from that Maynard school of like a small, small mouthpiece, big horn, you know, and, and get the big boy sound. Um, it's it's just really fun. I mean, that's that's a very different thing from, say, just take one of the classical classical classic models. I mean, it's like, yeah, that's a trumpet, and and you didn't think that was a small sound at all when when I was going like a like a beer flight from light to dark, you know. But then once you get to the the, the big ones, you go, oh, I see. So mm, it is a trade off, isn't it? Um, you know, this will this is more appropriate in your on your section, you know, gigs for sure. You know, in your trumpet section playing. But if you get to 
play solos the majority of the time. You know, you're in front of the ensemble or you're the only trumpet in some kind of chamber ensemble and it doesn't matter what horn you're playing on, then, you know, if the big bells feel comfortable in, in terms of how much resistance they offer you, then go there. And if not, then again, uh, coming back to we've got this... Um, we got the solo model, which is sort of the porridge that's just right in between them, where you've got the sound much more um, akin to a large bell and the blow of the smaller one. You know, and so, all right, that's a bit on the, that's certainly on the aggressive side. And this is a lead mouthpiece again, but. <clears throat> That's enormous. So I, I want one of these horns so that I can balance it out, where I've got one of these solo maxes, one of these, and then for other occasions where, you know, it really is, it's a lead job or something like that, then I'll switch to this one. I don't feel like I need to go any smaller than this in order to light people on fire, you know? <laughs> it's like, you know, nobody's gonna say, hey man, I, I wish your tone wasn't as thick when you were, when you were hurting me back then. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's the thing. We've got um, three large bell horns, one in the middle, and three smaller bell horns. Uh, the universal being the narrowest, and the classic models being something a little bit, um, a little bit more open, especially in the throat of the of the bell stem. So that's uh, that's where we're at. It's kind of you know same same deal like with the mouthpieces, where we've got a tool for each job. Um, we try to focus on on tools in terms of um, what kind of jobs you're doing and. And uh, so, yeah. <laughs>